Welcome, everybody. My name is Armando Berdiel, Technical Development Supervisor at Lighting Design Lab, and thank you for joining us for our class today, Network Lighting Controls for Healthcare Spaces, taught by our very own Sean Dara. Go to the next slide, please. And one more, please. All right. So, as you'll notice, you'll be all muted during the class, but please, you can still engage with us by uh, writing in the chat feature. We'll be able to look at your questions, and our presenter will be stopping around every 10 or so minutes to answer these questions. Uh, so, also participate in the online polls that we have for you. The more you participate, the more you engage, the, the better the experience is overall. Uh, after the class, there's going to be like a 30 second short survey. Let us know how we did. Please fill it out uh, when, once this class is done. Uh, so a reminder, a recording of the slide, a recording of class and the slide deck will be posted on our website. If you have any other questions or comments, please email us at lightingdesignlab at seattle.gov. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, so Lighting Design Lab, very much powered by and a part of Seattle City Light. We are all part of the city of Seattle family. We always want to make that point out there just to make sure it's all, all clear and, and, and standard. Uh, and slide, please. Uh, who we work with? Lighting Design Lab uh, has a 30 history of working with uh, trade allies. Those are your contractors, implementers, utility people, people that work in the retrofit markets. Uh, we also work a lot of design allies. Think about your building engineers, lighting designers, architects. Both trade allies, design allies have a great uh, hunger for knowledge and the best practices in the emerging technologies of the connected world. We also work a lot with end users, your building operators, facility professionals, ensuring that you know the three pieces of the Venn diagram are all involved in the practices and all the knowledge we can give them. And we also work a good amount with strategic partners, uh, such as the University of Washington's Integrated Design Lab, the NEEKS Smart Building Center, and good many others in, in just teamwork and, and ensuring that the emerging technologies of connected buildings get implemented. Next slide, please. For our core area, lighting design a good amount of education and training. We used to do in all hands-on uh, workshops, but now we are living in a virtual world. So we're doing all of these uh, awesome webinars. We also do technology evaluations, such as pilots, uh, demonstrations. We develop tools and resources, such as uh, luminar level lighting control videos, uh, network lighting control best practice guides. And we do a good amount of information aggregation, keeping our ear close to the ground on the lighting industry and being able to disseminate that information to our audience. Uh, with further ado, I'll leave you guys all with Sean. Good morning, everyone. Uh, welcome to the latest of the series of webinars that we've been doing since we have entered into the world of COVID. Uh, a little bit about myself. Uh, I'm looking at uh, the attendees list and I see that a number of you know me but just in case those who don't my name is Sean Dara I am a lighting designer I've been a lighting designer for more than 30 years horrifyingly enough and I've, I've done projects here there everywhere um, run several different lighting design firms at uh, various times throughout all of it a big part of what I have really focused on has been the notion of lighting controls and how we use lighting controls to maximize the benefits of our projects, minimize the energy use, and all of these really good things that we want to do. Fortunately, currently, I am lucky enough to be employed at the Lighting Design Lab, teaching classes very much like this. So uh, understand that I come at things from a very designerly standpoint. I also come at things from a very visual standpoint. So uh, I hope that that will give you some sense of how the remarks I'm about to give you uh, may be colored at some point during the talk that we go through today. Now that's a little bit about me. How about you? I would like to know a little bit about each of you so that I can go ahead and try to tailor my remarks to hopefully best serve what it is that you guys are looking to get out of this a uh, couple of hours that we're going to spend together. So if you would be kind enough, Armando had mentioned that we will do several polls. Here is one. So could you please tell me a little bit about yourselves? How do you most closely identify? 
Uh, do you consider yourself a design ally, an architect, engineer, lighting designer, interior designer, maybe a construction ally, a contractor, somebody who installs these things or, or perhaps uh, oversees purchasing of them, sales, are you a rep, a distributor, a manufacturer, a facility professional, you know, perhaps you're a building engineer or an institutional manager, uh, or do you work for a utility or government? I'll give you guys just a couple of seconds to go ahead and answer those questions. I always think I should have the Jeopardy uh, soundtrack going at this point. All right, so I am going to close this poll. We're going to do several of these, although they'll be more closely related to pop quizzes as we go through. And so about 20% of you uh, are design allies, excellent. 10% uh, or so are construction allies, 27 sales, uh, and the balance uh, primarily utility or government, excellent. Well, thank you all for participating in that. Uh, that will help me a little bit to try to identify or try to push discussions in uh, whatever sort of directions that we, we may want to do. Um, a quick little bit of housekeeping before we hide that, before we get going too too far. Um, there will be a several additional polls throughout the talk here uh, that are couched as pop quizzes. During those periods, I am going to try to address any questions that people have had throughout the the particular talk, so that uh, we maintain the rhythm of of keeping things going. So. It would be most helpful to me and hopefully for you as well. If you have questions as we're going through, please go ahead and enter them in the questions sort of chat bar that you've got there. They will show up on my screen here and I'll be able to see them. And I'll go through them as we talk uh, or, or as we stop at each particular uh, pop quiz and try to circle back and uh, um, answer them as, as best I can. So please go ahead and uh, don't necessarily wait until I ask you to uh, formulate questions. Go ahead and uh, pose them as they uh, as they come up. Fair enough? All right, let us jump right into the class. Most of the time you know we start with things like learning objectives. So by the end of the class today, we're going to have spent a little bit of time discussing lighting control strategies. I'm not going to spend a lot of time on it, but you should understand the basic strategies that we would use on a project and also the fundamental concepts of network lighting controls. Uh, we'll see some of those things. Um, look at how we might use lighting controls in the healthcare industry and in the healthcare environment. Uh, and we'll actually look at a number of practical appli applications in specific types of areas in which we might apply lighting controls and some of the strategies that we're going to use. I will say at the outset, this is not a deep dive network lighting controls class. In other words, we're not gonna spend an enormous amount of time talking about how network lighting controls work specifically a little bit. We're not gonna talk a huge amount about how things like sensors work and stuff like that. If you are interested in those things, take a look at the Lighting Design Labs education page and look at the uh, classes that we have already put up on our page that are recorded from before. If you would like to have that kind of deep dive information, please go there and take a look for my Network Lighting Controls two-day class. If you want kind of the basics of Network Lighting Controls, the fundamentals, that's where you can find it. Uh, it's a recording of the two hours, the first of the two days, will give you a really good overview of network lighting controls if there are things that are still uh, unclear after our time together today, okay? All right, so let us forge on. What are we talking about? So we're looking at the healthcare world, right? Healthcare spaces. That sounds really simple, right? We're talking about lighting for healthcare. Well, we're lighting controls for healthcare. What does that really mean? The, the thing is, healthcare spaces can range from anything from a private practice office where you might have, you know, a two-room uh, doctor's office with an anteroom and a uh, an exam room, you know, perhaps 
have some place like in the medical dental building downtown Seattle through small clinics or specialty clinics, hospitals, long-term care. There's a lot of different types of facilities that we might really start to talk about. And while they are all different, right, there are going to be major differences between what we might do in Children's Hospital here in Seattle versus what we might do in, say, a rural medical clinic in Red Lodge, Montana, right? We might have very, very different things going on, but there are a lot of commonalities. So if we think about these kinds of spaces, they're all going to have offices, right, of some kind or other. Most of the time, they'll have conference rooms and corridors, and there'll be some kind of check-in, check-out desk, something like that. There may be exam rooms, procedure rooms, labs. There are a lot of different kinds of spaces that we might look at with respect to commonalities. Again, whether we're talking about Children's Hospital or the Poly Clinic here in, in downtown Seattle, uh, or, or that, uh, that clinic in, in Red Lodge, Montana, wherever that happens to be, there are going to be some commonalities that we can address, right? And we're also going to spend a lot of time not entirely talking about the physical needs of the spaces. We're also going to spend some time talking today about the physiological needs of the people who occupy those spaces right? and how lighting controls may uh, interact with some of those physiological needs and how we can help, right? how we can help make spaces better. So there are, of course, those more specialized spaces within the healthcare environment. We might have patient rooms and a variety of different types of patient rooms. Um, there are certainly patient corridors. And what I mean by that is most commonly in, say, for example, a hospital, you'll likely have what we would call a double loaded corridor where you might have a, um, a nursing corridor with patient rooms on one or both sides of the corridor uh, that are inpatient facilities, right? Places that you might wind up having people staying overnight. Uh, imaging centers. So you might have places that do x-rays or more likely things like uh, CT, computer tomography scans, uh, MRIs, magnetic resonance imaging, things like that. You might have infusion or similar spaces uh, where people are going to be sitting for long-term uh, care. So that might be something like a chemotherapy center where you, know, you might have a chemo patient sitting in a hopefully comfortable chair for two, three, four hours while they get their chemo infusion or a similar kind of uh, uh, function at say a dialysis center where uh, somebody is, is hooked up to a dialysis machine for several hours in a day. You might have something like an LDRP room, the labor delivery recovery postpartum. These are spaces where essentially people will go and, and uh, uh, deliver babies, right? Uh, pharmacies, surgeries, uh, specific lab types. There are a lot of different specialty things that we can that we can look at. We'll look at some of these as we push through, uh, but understanding that um, lighting controls can make things better for all of these spaces, right? Okay. So let's talk a little bit about some of the trends in healthcare that we might find, right? We have in the past had this idea of what we would consider to be the traditional healthcare environment, right? You know, you've got a very white on white on white approach where you've got everything that looks really antiseptic and you've got, um, um, you know, a bunch of people in, in lab coats that look like Marcus Welby, MD, and, and it's very not friendly, welcoming environment, right? A more common approach these days is to start to trend healthcare environments towards hospitality, right? The idea is to try to engage the patient, engage the patient's family, get them to be more comfortable in the healthcare environment. Uh, this is a good example. This is an LDRP room, again, labor delivery recovery postpartum. Uh, and you'll notice, I mean, it starts to look a bit like a hotel room, right? Uh, you've got wooden floors there, uh, or at least wood tone floors. Uh, you've got uh, a variety of different finishes that don't necessarily evoke that kind of Marcus Welby aesthetic, right? So you wind up having this kind of space where uh, it really is more interested in the perceptions of the patient than they perhaps used to be in the past. Now, you've still got all the medical gases and, and all of that stuff on the wall. You've probably still got 
for anybody who likes Monty Python, you've still got the machine that goes bing in the corner, all of those kind of good things. But we start to change potentially patient outcomes with sort of design, right? So part of that comes in the whole notion that we're looking at things like patient-centered care and wellness, and in fact, outcomes-based care. So that kind of all comes together in this sort of view here, where we start to look at things like balancing. In the past, we were very much focused on the staff, on the, the, the um, um, aseptic nature of the spaces. Now we're kind of balancing a lot of things, right? We're looking at outcomes. We're focusing on patients. We're still balancing things like cost, right? We, we need to pay attention to cost. We spend more in the United States on healthcare than anyone else, um, as well as quality. This starts to look a little bit, for those of you who have been in the, in the industry for a while, it starts to look an awful lot like the uh, three-point corner that the uh, uh, IES puts together for lighting quality, right? So you wind up having lighting quality, balancing, uh, uh, architecture, uh, humans, uh, energy in the environment with, with um, uh, cost, right? So you sort of cycle and circle into where the patient is, and you start to look at a much more collaborative model, right? We're not really talking about this imperial doctor anymore with thou shalt do this. We're talking more about collaboration and making the patients part of their their healthcare and making the patients more comfortable. So we'll see as we go through here how we can actually make staff and patients more comfortable with lighting controls as we kind of as we kind of jump through. And there are some real specific concerns with respect to the healthcare industry uh, in terms of lighting and lighting controls. Now a lot of those come down to wellness. It's not just the wellness of the patients either, by the way, it's the wellness of the staff, right? We start to look particularly at things like circadian systems. If you don't know what that means, we'll talk about that going through. And we start to look at things like shift workers. So what does that mean? So in the US and Europe, 15 to 20% of all full-time personnel are engaged in shift work at some point, right? Now, if we think about that, the healthcare industry has an enormous percentage of shift workers, right? People who work at non-traditional times of the day. So it may not be that every doctor, every nurse, every orderly is always working shift work, but at some point in their career, almost anybody who is involved in the healthcare industry deeply will be drawing those nighttime shifts, will be drawing those weekend shifts, will be drawing those non-traditional shifts. And there are specific implications for them with respect to lighting, some of which we can ameliorate with lighting controls. Right? Um, if we think about very specific things, the incidence of breast cancer by industry, look at that. Healthcare and special and social assistance, 43% incidence of the, those people who are getting breast care, 43% are engaged somehow with healthcare or uh, healthcare delivery. That's staggering. And a lot of that has to do with potentially, at least the research is telling us, uh, with uh, uh, circadian systems and with uh, uh, light engagement at work. Okay, so I'm gonna caution, this is a lighting controls class. We are gonna talk about how lighting controls can dig into some of these things. If we were talking just about healthcare lighting, we could be here all week. I could I could be talking until I was hoarse about some of the things that we might really want to be looking at with respect to the lighting for healthcare. Um, we are going to focus deeply in. If you want to uh, dive in a little bit more into some of the topics surrounding light and health, human physiology, light and human perception, uh, again, go back to our lighting design lab. Uh, recorded classes, and you'll find that there is a class that I taught on, taught on light and uh, human perception, light and health, uh, last fall, and then I think one last spring as well. Uh, and you'll be able to take a look through there at some of the more deep dive elements that you might really want to talk about. We'll touch on some of that stuff today, but if you want the deep dive, uh, go to those places. Okay. All right. So let's do a look quick little bit of review here. It will come as no surprise to anyone here that when we're talking about lighting today, we're talking about three letters, 
L, E, and D. And we are talking about a light source that is different than anything that we've seen in the past, right? Those of you who have been in, in the industry for a while will know that even five, maybe 10 years ago, we would be having a very different class discussion today. We'd be talking about things like how to dim fluorescent, uh, are LEDs uh, uh, even usable in architecture? Can we dim HID? Are there times that we might want to use halogen, et cetera, et cetera? Today, that's all done. We're talking about LED, LED, LED. Now, there is some discussion in the industry about uh, what are the next uh, revolutionary light sources, right? Every now and again, we hear things like um, OLEDs, organic LEDs, uh, which are, are being used increasingly in things like televisions. Well, uh, as my colleague Eric Strandberg frequently points out, and I think correctly, um, OLEDs are the light source of the future and perhaps always will be. So that may come up at some point, but really we're talking about, or, about LEDs now. So what are some of the implications with respect to architecture and in particular healthcare light? Well, we have much smaller fixtures, right? They're better uh, efficacy with those fixtures, meaning we have uh, better uh, lumens coming out for fewer uh, watts uh, going in, right? But from uh, the perspective of this class, our key things are dimmability, right? Basically, every light source that you're gonna get in a hospital or healthcare environment today, I mean, unless we're talking really, really, really bottom shelf, it's gonna be dimmable one way or another, typically by a zero to 10 volt signal, or perhaps by a digital signal like Dolly or one of the proprietary protocols. Um, so dimming, we're gonna have much more flexibility and control, sometimes potential confusion, right? Uh, it, it always seems like people think that because everything is LED, it's gonna be much easier. It's, it's honestly not, it's actually the, the reverse. You really have to pay attention to what it is that you're doing. And then the new kid on the block is this idea of tunable color. And we'll talk about that uh, more specifically in just a few moments. So if we're talking about network lighting controls, which is what this class is really all about, what do we mean, right? We used to consider these things advanced lighting controls. And the idea was that they could do a lot of different things for us. So, occupancy or vacancy sensing and daylight sensing and task tuning and scheduling and all these things that used to be very expensive and it used to be reserved for the high-end systems now it's actually down to the mid-level systems right the things that i can do with a very inexpensive mid-level lighting control system would have been the extreme high end even 10 years ago right so this is a fantastic time to be doing uh, lighting controls now, what we really are talking about is the idea that either every light fixture or small groups of control zone light fixtures are digitally addressable so that we can dim them up and down in groups. We can program them. They can communicate either with each other or with a central control system. Uh, and from the perspective of potentially this class or some of the classes that we teach at the lighting lab, we're really looking at what I would consider to be the mid-range of the market, right? So you can still get the super high-end, big campus lighting control systems that will whiz bang, do everything. That's fantastic. If we're talking about retrofit applications, typically we're talking about parts and pieces approaches like the things that we see here, right? Uh, they may consist of, let me grab my spotlight. They may consist of things like uh, what we call load controllers, right? These are essentially devices that sit up by the light fixture that uh, turn it on and off, tell it to dim up, to, to dim down. We might have wireless uh, switches and dimmers and, and um, scene controllers. We might have wireless occupancy, vacancy sensors, all of these kinds of things. Um, but they all function as a kit of parts, make it super, super simple to retrofit a project and uh, relatively inexpensive to do so, right? And they all function on this idea of a distributed control system, right? In the old days, we used to think of lighting controls as switching, right? We would have a big relay cabinet in a, an electrical closet somewhere. It might be fed by a main lug system or it might be fed by individual circuits. And each one of those would go out to some, you know, large 20 amp um, um, 
lighting control circuit out in a big space and everything would go on or off. That was your choice. Today, we tend to be looking more at distributed systems where they can actually make use of one or two or three circuits or existing circuits that are already there in a space. We just go ahead and populate the space with lighting with fixtures that have devices that can dim up, can dim down, down on their own so that we don't really care anymore about how power is being fed to the light fixtures as long as power is being fed to the light fixtures. Now this can work with emergency and it can also work with standard normal feed, right? So we've got both of those things covered. But the idea is this simplifies everything, particularly for uh, installation for retrofit, right? If you've got an existing space and you want to go ahead and upgrade your lighting and lighting controls, you just leave the existing wiring where it is. Go ahead and take out your light fixtures, put your new light fixtures in, tie them in, hot neutral ground, you're off to the races, right? Everything else becomes wireless. Really, you're not really communicating via wires too much anymore. So I hope that makes sense. The the very specialized approach to this that we we really like actually is the notion of luminaire level lighting controls. So what this basically means is you take all of the devices, right? That's the load controller. That's what tells the the fixture to dim up, to dim down, or turn on, turn off, and tie it in with a sensor that is on board the light fixture. So that sensor uh, has occupancy, vacancy, and uh, daylight sensor already built in to each individual light fixture. So basically, you just put them up into the ceiling. Uh, it becomes very simple to design, very simple to specify, and super simple to, to set up, right? Very, very flexibly. Uh, terrific options for that. Now, there is another type of control that's a relatively newer kit on the block called Power Over Ethernet. And the idea is that instead of using traditional wiring, right, instead of using uh, the existing uh, 12 or 14 gauge wires that are, that are kind of in the space, um, now we replace all of that traditional wiring with the idea that we would have these specialized, I mean, they look like internet switches, right? They look like ethernet switchers that would sit in a, uh, uh, in a communications room. And you would wind up having a CAT6 cable going from each one of the fixtures back to a switcher in the, the, uh, in this control room, right? Now, uh, this is a method of doing, um, you can do luminaire level control this way. You can do, you can do network lighting control this way as well. Um, it's a little bit more specialized, uh, requires a little bit more thought, requires a little bit more sort of handholding. You can do a lot more potential high data throughput from these things. Um, some of the potential benefits include things like not needing to have an electrician run your wires because they're Cat5 cables. They're, they're not um, hardwired. So you plug in, plug in, call it good. Um, it's not really necessarily what we're talking about today, although everything that we do talk about today uh, can certainly be done by power over the ethernet as well. So however we do this, um, this is a, a listing of some of the controls systems that we use in our two-day classes. So when the world is spinning properly, we do uh, two-day hands-on classes that include uh, all of the information that you would really need to learn how to specify, purchase, implement some of these types of systems. And we have been fortunate enough to be engaged with a lot of different manufacturers who have donated product for us to use in these particular classes. Now, I wanna be clear, the reason for showing you this slide isn't to suggest that any of these manufacturers are better than any other manufacturers that you might see. What this is trying to show you is that there is a profusion of really good equipment on the market today so that there are a lot of different options out there for new construction and retrofit construction to maximize the benefits of your energy systems and your lighting control systems and how they might better improve the spaces that we live, work, play, heal in, right? 
So at the end of the day, the key thing here is that network lighting controls, however we put them together, are so much better than they've ever been. Even over the last five years, the improvement has tremendously increased, right? They're smarter, they're simpler, they're cheaper, they're a lot cheaper than they've ever been. Uh, and they make terrific sense in almost every application that we might go through, okay? So we have reached that magical, magical moment where we have a pop quiz. I told you, I warned you, I warned you there would be pop quizzes here. So what are some of the benefits of using LLLC systems? And again, LLLC is a subsystem of network lighting controls or a subset of network lighting controls. They can work in network lighting control systems, but they're those light fixtures that have all of the equipment already on board when you get them from the factory. So, are they simplified design and installation, more complexity, out-of-the-box functionality, utility incentives for retrofits, or automatic code compliance? Going to give you a little bit more of that do 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 music. Going to give you about five more seconds. Do do do. do. All right, most of you have voted. I am gonna close this out and share the response. All right, so most of you feel that the, one of the benefits is simplified design and installation. And from my perspective, that's absolutely true. Um, particularly, if, if we think about projects, um, we, we tend, uh, in the industry, some of us tend to think, uh, when we think lighting projects, we tend to gravitate towards primarily sort of the high-end projects, um, but I'm going to suggest to you that um, there was a, there was a, a survey done by the um, um, IALD, International Association of Lighting Designers, a number of years ago, and that survey suggested that um, a very small percentage of projects, architectural projects, ever actually had a uh, lighting designer uh, or a an electrical engineer who had a lighting design background associated with that particular project. So uh, if you have a project where people may not be hugely up to speed on lighting controls, um, the simplification of LLLC is tremendously helpful. Uh, of course, more complexity, it, it doesn't really add more complexity, it reduces complexity. Um, out of the box functionality, that ties into what I was just saying, which is that um, most of these systems have some level of programming. Even if you just stick them up in the ceiling, uh, they're gonna have some level of dimming for daylight and some level of occupancy or vacancy sensing based on each light fixture. In preference, we would want to see those uh, really properly tuned, fine-tuned, but even if they're not, they're still getting you 70 or 80 percent of the benefits right out of the box. Uh, automatic code compliance is another one. Most energy codes, if you have LLC light fixtures, you can check a box. You don't have to go ahead and do all of the onerous energy code documentation. Now there is one other one here uh, that interestingly nobody picked. Um, many, not all, many ut electric utilities um, actually have specific incentives for retrofit projects using LLLC systems. Uh, for example, Seattle City Light. Uh, if you're doing a project and you're using uh, light fixtures with LLLC, uh, you'll get all the normal benefits, the energy savings, all that stuff is fantastic. You'll also get a, uh, for most projects, you'll get a uh, $50 per light fixture kicker to help pay for the cost of the incremental cost of the LLC equipment. Uh, Puget Sound Energy has a similar program. Uh, so there are a number of different options out there. 
All right. Uh, questions, 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 questions. Nobody has any questions so far. All right. I'm going to hide the poll. And we will forge forward. Uh, again, if you have any questions, please go ahead and enter them into the box. All right. Moving forward. All right, let's spend just a couple of moments uh, review. Again, this is not a deep dive class with respect to any of these, but I think it's worthwhile to take a look at some of these, particularly as they relate to healthcare, but also as they relate to what we might think of as modern network lighting controls. So these are the same control strategies. There's nothing new here. Um, I've been using and teaching these same control strategies for 30 odd years. Um, what is new is that some of them are easier than they've ever been. For example, astronomic scheduling is much easier than it's ever been. Uh, and all of them work better than they've ever worked before. Uh, we can all talk about times that we've seen occupancy sensors that didn't work. Well, we'll talk about that in, in just a moment. So let's hit just a couple of these uh, jumping forward. So manual switching, right? We all understand you, know, you, you hit a button on a wall or a toggle switch or something, lights go on, lights go off. Might happen in one of a variety of different ways. There might be uh, line voltage control with a toggle switch that might go back to a relay panel. There might be some other thing going on. Uh, manual dimming, right? Uh, we press and hold a button and lights go up and lights go down, or we put a slider up and down, lights go up, go down. Uh, a lot of different ways that we can do that. Again, same thing, might be a uh, an actual power handling device in the wall. So it might be a line voltage slider dimmer, we call it a wall box or a, a uh, strap dimmer in the wall, or it might be some kind of device that's sending say a zero to 10 volt signal or a digital signal to a load controller or, or some remote dimming cabinet, whatever that happens to be. But the key thing is you, you slide up and down or you, you, you raise and lower the, the lights. And the third one is this idea of a scene or a preset. A preset is essentially a group of control zones that you can toggle or you can uh, engage repeatedly, right, with some level of programming. So you push a button, the lights always do the same thing. You push another button, the lights always do the same thing, right? So this used to be complicated, used to be difficult, right? We used to have devices like the graphic eye that we have here that were fairly expensive. The graphic eye that we see here might have had power handling strap and wall box dimmers associated with it behind it, or it might be communicating to a remote dimming cabinet somewhere that would be raising the lights up and down, however that comes together. But the key thing is that it used to be complicated. When we're talking about modern network lighting controls today, we're actually talking about this whole idea of a parts and pieces approach, right? So what we have here is an example of one of the programming control boards that I, I built for uh, my, my uh, hands-on classes. And what you'll see here is essentially a series of control zones, right? We have five different control zones in this particular case that correspond to an office, right? So here's an open plan office with uh, a zone that's far from daylight, a zone that's close to daylight. We have a uh, zone zone that's in a private office. And then we have two zones in a conference room, right? The general area lighting and then the wall wash. And the point here is that this is meant to emulate building wiring, right? So the only difference between this and a typical building is that the amount of conduit between each one of these boxes is two inches instead of 10 or 20 feet, right? We have a wire coming in from a load center, right, from a breaker panel, and it's through wired from box to box to box, and then something else happens, right? So we've got the light fixtures here, then we've got these parts and pieces. In this particular case, this is what we call, again, a load controller. And this is providing a relay on off. It's also providing a zero to 10 volt dim up, dim down signal to each one of these uh, devices, right? Each one of these fixtures or control zones. What we have down here are 
some of the wireless switches that we might have. Now, this particular manufacturer is Lutron. I could have done this with any of the variety of lighting control systems that we happen to have uh, within our system. It just happened to be convenient that I had this board set up this way when I decided to do this, this little video. So this is a what we would think of as a manual switch, right? This is what we would think of as a manual switch dimmer. Right? So we have a, an up down with a dimmer, and then we have a scene control device here. So let me play this for you. So I'm taking the on off switch, turned all the lights on, all the control zones, right? And turned all the control zones off. So that's our manual switch for this kind of network lighting control system. Now I can turn, if I want just one of those on, and then I can raise and lower, I can dim it up down. So this gives us our manual dimming functionality. Now the incremental cost between each one of these devices is negligible. There's almost no cost difference between that two button switch, the three button with raise lower that we have here that has a preset in the middle, and then the four button preset at the end. Relatively little difference between them, right? This is important. So in the old days, having the choice between switching or dimming or scene control used to be very expensive, right? There were implications there. Now, for the most part, it's actually simply a matter of program. Choose what you want, and if you want to change it later, you don't have to rewire anything. You go ahead and simply bring in a different device. You're programming it. Programming today normally happens on something that looks an awful lot like this, right? It's a phone, or it's a, an iPad, or it's a, an Android tablet, whatever that happens to be. So we have lots and lots of options right, within these network lighting control systems. This becomes really useful, particularly in those areas like healthcare, where we're really interested in the patient experience, right? Also the staff experience. Okay, let's go on. So that's manual switching, dimming, preset, right? Um, just a little bit here about occupancy and vacancy sensing, right? Just as review. Occupancy sensing, of course, basically means you walk into a space, the so lights go on, but you walk into a space, so you leave a space, the lights go off. In healthcare, this is tremendously useful in places like corridors, uh, toilet rooms, places like that, parking garages, site lighting, any of those kinds of spaces. Vacancy sensing, by contrast, means that you have to press a button. You have to turn the lights on in order for them to engage. Then after you're gone for a while, they'll, they'll turn themselves off. This might be useful, particularly in places like storage rooms. It might be useful in places like offices, spaces like that. Daylight harvesting, of course, is a process where we use photocells, uh, either looking at a particular space within a particular place within the room that we're controlling, or doing something we call open loop and looking outside to the sky, and then dimming the lights up and down accordingly based on some kind of threshold. Now, in the past, we used to turn the lights on and turn them off. Today, given the fact that we have everything is dimmable, the preference is to dim up to dim down. Right? The idea is that we don't want to have any herky-jerky motions that might annoy people. Right? We want it to be very smooth. People shouldn't notice that anything is going on. Now, in the healthcare environment, this is typically going to work in places like offices, uh, circulation, uh, and things like lobbies, like here we have in the Cleveland Clinic uh, lobby. There'd be daylight dimming controls here. We tend not to use them in places like patient rooms for the same reasons that we tend not to use them in places like hotels. Uh, we want to have a um, finer level of control in some of those spaces for a lot of different reasons. Another one of the things that we might look at is task tuning or high trim. And this is the idea that since we have dimmable light fixtures and light fixtures are broad brush strokes, we might want to be able to go ahead and tune the output in every location so that we're matching what we want for our target light level. So in a, an office, for example, we might have 
a space overlighted by as much as 20 or 30 percent in order to accommodate things like um, lumen depreciation over time or to accommodate potential problems with finishes that might change during design or whatever that happens to be. In my own former offices in the Bullet Center when I was running Luma Lighting, uh, when I task tuned in that space, I was saving um, about 25% of the energy right off the top of the bat. So this can be a huge, huge benefit uh, from an energy standpoint while actually not costing anything. Once you have the system that we're talking about, any kind of these network lighting control systems, it's just a programming feature, right? You program it to bring the lights to where your target light level is, and it has benefits to the staff and the people that are there. It reduces glare. It makes spaces more comfortable, potentially, right? This is a key thing. You might find time scheduling. Typically, in the healthcare environment, time scheduling is more to do with things like uh, places like this, right? Circulation, public areas, um, any place where you might really not want to use occupancy or vacancy sensors. You might use occupancy and vacancy sensors in things like clinic corridors, but you probably wouldn't use them in a clinic uh, waiting room or lobby or someplace like that. So time scheduling might, might work better for you there. Okay. Now, those are some of the very traditional lighting control strategies that we might see in healthcare. Some of the newer strategies that we have out there, right? Uh, and these are all engendered by the fact that we're using LEDs, that LEDs are very special little, little devices. Um, and then we can do things that we never used to be able to do relatively easily. Now, the key ones, there are a number of others, um, you know, besides the three that we have here. But the key ones for healthcare have to do with selecting color uh, and um, circadian lighting with respect to tunable light. Now, this is an example. This is a relatively early example. This is Children's Hospital. Uh, this is one that we did with CGF uh, a number of years ago. Um, memory says this was completed in 2011 or 2012. Now, we had, based on some of the original research that was being done with respect to shift workers and uh, breast, ca uh, breast cancer incidents, among others, uh, we had proposed that we would do uh, some level of circadian lighting, which is essentially looking at changing colors, uh, adding more blue light into the, the, the mix in uh, a lot of the staff areas. Uh, unfortunately, at that time, it was relatively expensive, right? It was going to cost a lot of money to be able to implement something like that. So what we did is reverted simply to this color tuning option for the kids. Right? You'll see that there is a slot here where colored LED grazes down, and the kids have the ability through a controller at their bed to change the color, right? They can change whatever color they want, 16 point something million, 16.3 million color gamut, whatever it is. Um, there's no particular health benefit here other than giving the, the, the child the chance to affect their environment, which is uh, potentially beneficial. Uh, and it also gives the child the ability to be distracted, right? This poor kid might be here for a day, might be here for a month, might be here for six months. Who knows? Um, but it gives the child the ability to go ahead and hopefully have a little bit of delight in their space. Now, in that kind of vein, we wind up seeing now in a lot of hospital environments, um, we wind up seeing examples like this where we might have color tuning, things that are visually stimulating, things that add interest for children. Now, we're not necessarily trying to turn our hospitals into Las Vegas but we are trying to give the ability to have some measure of delight, some measure of distraction, some measure of, again, visual interest uh, for the kids as they're coming through in these places. Now, that is a little bit beyond the range of what we would normally consider to be part of a uh, network lighting control system. In those kind of cases, we'd probably be using something like DMX 512 as an adjunct system to also control the lighting for those kind of places. But when we get down into the more simplified kind of realm, um, one of the key things that we, we are seeing is the notion of tunable light, 
What does that mean? So hopefully everybody on the call will understand the term CCT, correlated color temperature. And the idea is that we can change from relatively warm to relatively blue uh, in, in a couple of different ways uh, along what we call the black body radiator curve. So basically think of that as we can adjust the color along what we would think of as the white portion of that, that chromaticity curve, if you know the CIE chromaticity curve. Uh, again, if this is all sounding unfamiliar, please look at the light and human perception class that, that I've recorded. Um, but the idea is that, um, the theory is that, that tuning the color temperature might have some benefits for uh, affecting mood or alertness of the participants in whatever they happen to be. Uh, maybe that means that they're, it's making a doctor more alert. Maybe it means it's making a patient more alert or it's resetting our circadian systems, uh, or they're just aesthetic reasons. Uh, but the idea is we can tune the lighting warm, cool. We'll talk about why in a little bit. Um, this is very popular uh, in discussions with respect to uh, schools, right? Where we might want to have kids more alert at certain times and calmer at other times. So people are doing a lot of research kind of looking into these kinds of things. Uh, and it's relatively easy to control with these network lighting control systems. Now, I keep talking about the notion of circadian controls, and this is essentially meant to uh, help regulate your sleep-wake alert, asleep kind of functioning within your, your physiology. Um, we'll talk very specifically about some details of that in just a minute. Um, there is an interesting study here, and in fact, it's included in your handouts. So if you, uh, and I didn't mention that at the beginning, if you look on your control panel, you'll see a tab that says handouts, there are five handouts there. Uh, four of them are studies that have been done by various people like uh, uh, Mark Ray and uh, Mariana Figueroa from uh, Lighting Research Center, now from Mount Sinai. Um, um, I forget the rest of the Mount Sinai um, group name. Uh, or uh, in this particular case, this study was done by, uh, in conjunction with, I believe, PNNL and um, SMUD, Sacramento Municipal Utility District, on a, um, uh, a long-term care center with respect to changes in light and uh, the behavior and sleep of the residents. I would encourage you to kind of look at those. They'll, they'll give you a little bit more about circadian stuff. Okay, before we dive into some of that circadian stuff, and we will, I promise we will dive into it, um, just a little bit about the notion of hardware, right? So I've gone through very, very quickly uh, some of the parts and pieces that we might use in some of these uh, healthcare control systems, uh, load controllers, switches, dimmers, scene selectors, occupancy, vacancy sensors, daylight sensors, a lot of different things. Now, one of the things I, I usually try to stress to anybody in any of my classes here is that you really want to consider a little bit about hardware evolution as we think about not just lighting controls, all building controls. In fact, everything that is in our lives from a digital standpoint. We have really, in the last 15, 20, 25 years, had a prodigious shift from the analog to the digital. Right. So one of the analogs that I kind of use to describe this is my phones. Right. Um, I was one of those people um, that had a bag phone, scarily enough, uh, because I needed to be in touch with my clients. Uh, at the time, I was, was doing uh, uh, theater special effects, and it was very helpful for me for clients to be able to get a hold of me whenever they needed to do so. Uh, but if you, you know, you went a few years further on, um, you know, I had a phone, I had a cell phone, right? It was a big, chunky thing with a big antenna. Push forward just a few years after that, I had a Crackberry, right? I was one of those guys that when the plane landed, I'd be thumbing through the my emails, right? Um, throughout all of those times, I was really thrilled if I could get an actual phone call that didn't sound like I was in the middle of a fish tank. Well, today, we have just a few years later, now we have portable computers that we have in our pockets that can 
basically do anything that huge computers used to do for us. Now, this is true with, with lighting controls and all kinds of building controls as well, right? Um, not too long ago, when we started this, we would think of lighting control as the big knife switch that the mad scientist has there, right? We've gone through things like three ways and contactors and preset dimming and zone control wireless system. We're all the way into power over ethernet and the internet of things now, right? But the whole idea is as we go forward in this analog to digital conversion, the hardware has gotten tremendously better, tremendously less complicated from the perspective of the end user. It might be more complicated from the perspective of the programmers and those people. But honestly, um, you know, we can complain all we want about you know how how various apps might work or whatever. But the fact is, this is a relatively seamless device. Right? Same is true for lighting controls. Now, it's very rare that you're going to find, say, a false trigger from a an occupancy sensor, uh, for example, because it's almost always going to mean that it's a, a problem with the design, not a problem with the uh, hardware itself, right? Um, so some things to think about there. Okay, so uh, before we press on about some other topics, let's do our next pop quiz. So our color tuning, and tunable light, the same thing. Okay. Yes, no, maybe, blue, what blue? So the question here is all about um, whether if we're talking about lighting controls, uh, is it the same if we're talking about changing along the correlated color temperature spectrum, right, from relatively warm, let's say 2700 Kelvin, all the way up to 5000 Kelvin, are we doing that the same as we are doing maybe for some of those arc attainment value things like, for example, that we did for Children's Hospital or for the example that I showed you of the hospital that had um, the color images or the, 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 the color washing that was for uh, primarily for visual interest. All right. Gonna give you just a couple more seconds as I sip my tea. All right, I am going to close and I am going to share. So 29% yes, 57% no, 14% maybe. Um, so the real answer is, well, I suppose I could say maybe as well. The real answer is no. Um, color tuning, when we're talking about color tuning and tunable white, we're typically not talking about the same things. When we're talking about color tuning, what we're actually usually talking about is having multiple color chips that we are um, essentially creating uh, color mixing environments where we are having additive red, green, blue, amber, potentially white, multiple chips operating at different intensities that mix to give us different colors. When we're talking about tunable white, typically we're talking about one or two or three flavors of white light chips that are warmer, mid-range, maybe cooler, and then pushing the color spectrum or the, the spectral power density of the light source to one end or the other based on the percentage of which flavor of white we're talking about. Now, it's potentially possible to go ahead and mix to white with the red, green, blue, amber, or multiple color chips, but it's relatively expensive to do it that way. So it's, it's probably not something that we're gonna see. Okay, let's hide that. All right. Um, let us talk just briefly about some of the reasons that we might use advanced lighting controls. We will then talk a little bit about some of the very specific concerns with respect to light and physiology in uh, healthcare and how we might use lighting controls to modulate those things. And then we'll jump into a few examples as we start to see some very practical opportunities here. There are a lot of different reasons that we might use advanced or networked lighting controls, right? Um, 
energy to be sure is one of them but it's rarely kind of the most important one at least from most owners perspective also from most healthcare owners perspective right um, patient outcomes and uh, staff concerns tend to outweigh the relatively inexpensive energy savings right so just bear that in mind um, a lot of times we're talking really about non-energy benefits uh, which is not to say that the energy savings are not significant because they really are. Um, when I did a retrofit of my offices in the Bullet Center uh, up on Capitol Hill here in Seattle, um, I saved something like 70% of the energy uh, that we were using, and we were already being pretty darn uh, good with respect to energy use just from the, the basic design. Uh, there are a couple of things. I mean, none of this is, is unusual. Uh, if you want to see detailed discussion of these, again, go back to that um, uh, the class that I had taught previously on uh, network lighting controls, and we go through exactly what we mean by all of these and what some of the real keys are. Uh, from a healthcare standpoint, the big ones, though, are staff wellness and patient outcomes. So let's talk a little bit about some of those. Right. Um, as I've mentioned, in the U.S. and Europe, uh, 15 to 20 percent of all full-time personnel are engaged in shift work at some point or another. Right. Um, healthcare workers, a huge percentage of, of that. Um, more than 7 million Americans are engaged in work with non-traditional hours at any given point. Now, this is a real big issue, right? Because there are, there are uh, physiological health issues that are specifically engendered by some of these things and probably engendered by our interaction, our physiological interaction with light uh, and the environment in which we find us. Uh, in fact, shift workers, uh, the potential incidence for breast cancer uh, may be more than two to one uh, versus people who are not shift workers, right? So these are significant things. Now, the study is ongoing. I can't, I can't sort of say that, that um, um, you know, we have full information about all of this stuff yet. Um, there is ongoing research. Uh, of course, there's never enough funding for research for lighting, and uh, but what funding there is predominantly is going towards light and health. So some of the other specific concerns for shift workers, right, there's poor sleep quality, right? If you're um, not able to get in a full night's sleep, there are specific uh, potential issues with that, particularly long term. Right, um, poor sleep quality long term has been associated with things like uh, dementia. Right, uh, problems with that. So, mood, metabolism. Right, um, you find that that uh, shift workers tend to have uh, higher problems with uh, with weight or obesity, uh, cancer, of course, cardiovascular disease. There's a lot of this stuff out there, and I would encourage you to take a look at the studies that I have included in the handouts uh, for more specific information about some of those things. Okay, so if we're talking about this whole light and health thing, right, uh, and this is, if you go to any of the lighting uh, conferences, right, and hopefully we'll start to be able to do this in person again at some point, we're really looking at a lot of research with respect to light and health, like human health, light and physiology, uh, and how we can potentially modulate or mitigate some of the potential negative effects of, frankly, light that is being delivered in ways in which we were not evolved to see it, right, to accept it. Um, and we've talked about some of these things, circadian systems, we'll, we'll jump through in that in just a moment, but it has impacts for aging populations, dementia. Um, blue light hazard is something, if, if you know the term blue light hazard, great. Um, it's not something that really we worry about so much in the moment. Um, if you have questions about that, go ahead and um, we'll talk about that later. Um, Flickr. Uh, Flickr is another one that we'll talk about. If you are specifically interested in Flickr, uh, next Thursday, the IES Seattle is going to be hosting Naomi Miller from uh, PNNL, uh, and among other places in the past. Uh, and she'll be talking about uh, specifically about Flickr and some of the uh, metrics that we may be looking at for that. So if you're interested in that, uh, Google IES Seattle section, and you'll be able to sign up. Uh, it's a free webinar. You'll be able to sign up uh, for our lunchtime webinar for that. So let's jump into the whole circadian question. Right? I keep, keep kind of tossing this around. 
So light has a rhythm, uh, light has a uh, part of our circadian system, right? So hopefully it won't come as a surprise to anyone that we all experience this idea of circadian rhythm, right? There are times during the day when we're more alert or less alert, when our blood pressure is higher or lower, when we're um, faster or slower, whatever they happen to be. In fact, one of the interesting things that I read a while ago had to do with even minor changes for things like Olympic athletes, right? So an Olympic athlete might be better suited to running fast at a specific time of the day than other. Now, this may not have an enormous impact, but when you're talking about that level of competition, uh, time of day might mean the difference between a gold medal or no medal, right? So there are some specific uh, issues that happen here. So light uh, interacts uh, you know, with our visual systems, right? We have image forming rods and cones in our eyes. Turns out that there are other systems or other uses with respect to light and our physiology. Now, this all kind of gets regulated and I'm gonna be super, super um, high level here and I'm going to be perhaps a little less precise than I might be in a class that was more specific to this. But um, let's say that uh, trying to keep things wildly simplified, um, we have this, this um, uh, thing called the superchiasmatic nucleus. Uh, and this is a hormonal device that, you know, brains, that regulates things having to do with these circadian rhythms using uh, our endocrine system with chemical markers, right? So think of the, the key ones that we all know about, melatonin and serotonin, right? We think, think of them as sleep-wake hormones, right? So when you have um, melatonin suppressed, the serotonin takes over and that, that gives us our wakefulness. When melatonin throughout the day, melatonin builds up, builds up, builds up, including something we might consider, we might call sleep pressure, right? As it builds up, um, then the serotonin sort of suppresses and we go to sleep, right? So it seems fairly, fairly normal, right? All right, so let's go ahead and talk about some of those specifics. Um, in the 1920s, there was some interesting research that was done with mice that had no visual receptors. Right. And the research um, researchers noted that the, the pupils uh, would expand or contract based on uh, the availability of light within that space, which seemed really strange because they had no visual receptors, right? They had no rods, cones. So what was going on there? Well, that kind of interesting research got shelved. Then if we push forward to the early 2000s, uh, there were a number of researchers, uh, a couple in particular, Ignazio Provenzio and uh, Samar Hattar, were doing research and they discovered this whole idea of a whole new class of visual, not visual receptors, a whole new class of light receptors in our eyes that uh, helped to regulate this whole um, serotonin, melatonin, um, circadian system, right? The idea was that we had this range of cells called intrinsically photosensitive retinal ganglion cells, IPRGCs. Now imagine that we have rods, we have cones, then we have intrinsically photosensitive retinal ganglion cells, which rolls out the tongue. But the idea is that these cells are not specifically related to vision forming. These cells are related to essentially helping the circadian system to know when it's daytime, right? So how does this work? Well, the rods and the cones in our eyes are, and again, I'm really simplifying this, are sensitive to have peak sensitivity to specific parts of the spectrum, right? It shouldn't surprise anybody that uh, our color vision system, for example, has a peak sensitivity in that sort of greenish yellow range, which is why so many fire trucks were, you know, starting in the 70s, were, were painted with that color, right? Because that's what is most visible to us. Well, these IPRGCs, that actual peak sensitivity shifts much further into the deep blue, right? So 
they also tend to be relatively slow to react, but they're governing things like uh, their circadian rhythm, the size of our pupils, melatonin suppression, all those kinds of things. But this is one of those things where since the peak sensitivity shifts towards the blue, we're actually seeing or we've seen a lot of interest in things like high color temperature, relatively bluer light, right? 4,000, 5,000 Kelvin as the idea that we would go ahead and make people more alert, wake people up, give them alerting functions. During the evenings when we wanted to go to sleep, we would wind up seeing things like shifting to the, the warmer, to the 3,000, 2,700 Kelvin range, so that we would get out of this IPRGC range, so that we would go ahead and have less um, stimulus, so that the um, melatonin could take over and allow us to go to sleep. Right. All right. So again, I'm, I'm heavily simplifying this, but the idea would be that color is the primary thing or spectral power distribution more accurately, how much of that part of the spectrum that is we would consider to be action spectrum that would be affecting the IPRGCs do we see within that particular beam of light. Problem is, you know, we don't really know what we don't know. Right. So what is it that we do know? As I mentioned, the, the um, research is ongoing, right? Uh, a lot of people doing great research out there. Uh, Steve Lockley, Bud Brainerd, uh, Mariana Figuero, um, lots and lots of people. Uh, Jay Knights here at the University of Washington is doing uh, research into some of this stuff. So the problem is that we don't have a lot of consensus standards truly developed yet. Right. Um, we think we know some things, we think we know a variety of different things, but, and, and there certainly is a lot of interest in the, in the public press about this, right? Um, there was a lot of interest, for example, in blue light hazard, which proved not to be really a, a particular problem. But we are still kind of figuring out what it is that we really should be telling people to do. So from a lighting, strictly lighting, not lighting control standpoint yet, from a lighting standpoint, um, I like to engage in something called the lighting Hippocratic Oath, which basically means first do no harm, right? So I'm not a doctor, I'm not a clinician, I am not going to sit here and tell you that you should use blue light or warm light or any other kind of light in a healthcare environment. Um, we really need to be looking at what the research is telling us and what the consensus standards are really uh, sort of developing. Now, the good news from a lighting controls standpoint, well, how about that? What do we know about this stuff? It's actually a little bit easier to first do no harm with respect to lighting controls. So circadian entrainment, okay, what do we know about it? We know that, that our um, sleep-wake cycle, our um, circadian system, actually is a little bit more than 24 hours uh, in a given day, which is a little, we think that's a little bit odd, but who knows why that developed that way. But your normal circadian system has to be reset every day, right? So how do you do that, right? You have to reset that sleep-wake cycle every day. One of the easy ways to do that is with light, with light um, uh, exposure. One of the best ways to do that, of course, is to go outside in the morning for half an hour, an hour, whatever it happens to be. Um, another way to do that is to provide yourself a specific high level of light at your eyes coming in from a specific sort of angle from above that has enough blue in it to be able to go ahead and affect your, your IPRGCs. So I'm sitting here at my home office. Um, I actually have a setup where I am trying to um, test some of this stuff anecdotally for myself. And if I've got a light meter right here, right? What I'm interested in is how much light are my eyes seeing vertically at this point. So if you can see there, I'm seeing 46 foot candles right now at my eyes coming in from above. That's fairly high light level, isn't it? 
that's just trying to give you some sense of, of you know, what we might be talking about with, with some of these things. So again, lighting, if you want to think more about lighting, please go back and take a look at uh, the classes on light and health, light and human perception. But from a standpoint of lighting controls, here we can think about this. We've got from the notion of all of the information that we're getting from the researchers, there are a handful of variables that we need to be able to control in order to provide. Uh, Christy says audio is really cutting out. Is that true? Could somebody else? Uh, could somebody else tune in and let me know if that's happening or if that's specific to Christy? Christy, that may be specific to your, your, uh, yeah, sorry, Christy, that's, that's actually specific to your bandwidth, I'm afraid. Um, thank you. Thank you, uh, Leora and uh, Philippe. So um, there are several uh, variables that we talk about when we talk about circadian entrainment lighting intensity, distribution, spectral power distribution, duration, which is the dose, timing, when is the dose happening, and your photobiological history. So what do we, what do we mean by these, right? And how can we start to, to think about, if you look at these, it's interesting, right? All but one of them can be controlled with networked lighting controls within the healthcare environment. So if we jump through intensity, what does that mean? Well, that's the amount of light that we see, right? That's why I was just showing you how much light I was seeing at my eye, because that tells you how much light people are interacting with, right? And we typically measure it. I'm seated right now at my desk. I have lights in front of me, lights coming in doing this. If we look at this typical nurse station, right? If we are measuring the light hitting, the retinas hitting the, the eyes of the people sitting here, they're probably not going to be getting a very high light level, right? from that light from above. So that might be an issue for them. That might be something that we can modulate over time, uh, more light at specific times, less light at other times, um, as these consensus ideas develop, we have the ability to, to modulate that, right? Or distribution, right? The distribution is the angle or where the light is coming from. The idea is that you want to have light coming from above. I have a light right there that is actually giving me that light that is bringing the light from above. Think about this as the light coming in from blue sky, right? That's where the the um, that's where the, the IPRGCs are expecting the light to come from. That's where the stimulus matters, right? So uh, it's not to say that indirect lighting is bad or any of those things. Indirect lighting is phenomenal but you gotta pay attention to from, a, from a, um, that standpoint. Now, this is the one thing that you really can't change with lighting controls. Everything else you can, right? So if the standards today say this and the standards tomorrow say something else, we can adjust them based on the lighting controls. It's kind of future-proofing, right? Okay, spectral power distribution. What wavelengths are there, right? How warm or how cool, what parts of the spectrum are represented? We can again modulate this depending on the lighting control system that we have uh, in order to, to um, uh, impact these things. Now I'm gonna tell you all of, or I shouldn't say all, a, an enormous part of the industry kind of focuses on this whole spectral power distribution, how blue or how warm is the light. Um, and I'm gonna tell you that's because it's really easy, right? It's very simple to, to modulate that, it's very obvious. Uh, but a lot of the research is showing that this probably isn't as important as perhaps the intensity, right, uh, and the directionality. So um, if you're really interested in that, uh, Google, Google Kevin Hauser, and Kevin actually just, uh, oh gosh, I forget the exact name of the title, but it's something like human-centric lighting, myths, magic, and something or other. Um, terrific uh, uh, paper, and also, which I think is in uh, Logos maybe, and uh, also he's, he's uh, put together a um, uh, maybe 15 minute uh, video uh, talking about the relationship on some of these things. Um, duration, um, how long uh, 
are you exposed to a specific light level, right? Um, there are people that are actually developing dosimeters, basically little cards that you can wear that can tell you how long you have been exposed to light at sufficient uh, uh, wavelengths in order to stimulate the RPRGCs and reset your circadian rhythms, right? Tie down. Um, when are you subjected to the stimulus? Typically, you want to have that stimulus uh, for day active people. You want it to be in the morning, right? You want it to be when you wake up. Uh, the well building standard, for example, I believe it's uh, four hours of uh, interaction with, uh, uh, you know, a high level of light that has a specific amount of, of uh, blue in it for four hours, right? Uh, that may not be the most appropriate for people like shift workers, right? Where resetting that circadian uh, clock may wind up being a different time. Uh, however, for day active workers, that, that might be a problem, right? Um, you don't necessarily want to be uh, resetting your circadian clock at 5.30 in the evening because then you're gonna go home and you're gonna want to go to sleep. So having these kinds of abilities to modulate um, between intensities and time and all these things really make lighting controls uh, fairly sensible, uh, but it also sort of gives you a, a hint as to how complex this potentially can be from the perspective of the built environment where you have people, you know, working all day long. Right? Um, the last part of this is the whole notion of photobiological history, right? And this is uh, over time, um, you develop patterns, right? Uh, it's going to be best for you if you are exposed to bright light in what you consider to be your morning, right? The time that you're wanting to become alert, you're wanting the serotonin to take over. It's best for you to be um, exposed to much, much, much lower light levels in the evenings and at night when you are expecting the melatonin to take over and get you ready for sleep. This doesn't really work so well with some of the lighting exposure patterns that we have in our world, right? Where in the evenings at home, we are potentially exposed to very high light levels or places like shopping centers or uh, carports, uh, places where we, we fill up with gas, where we have very high light levels. So there, is, there are some interesting issues going on there as well. Now, uh, again, as I kind of mentioned, uh, the whole notion of lighting controls can come to the rescue for some of this, right? Um, we can control basically all of these variables with the exception of distribution from lighting controls, right? We can modulate uh, much brighter light levels during what we consider to be our morning and dim them way down uh, during the evening, right? We can change the color temperature or the color spectral power distribution of the light source based on which LED chips we're looking at. We can set timing, we can set duration, we can even go ahead and set programming. Um, I, have, I have things programmed in my home so that there are some light sources that really they'll, they'll, they'll diminish over time, right? That they will get lower and lower. My, my uh, living room lighting, for example, Early evening, it's a higher light level than later in the evening. It slowly dims down. And this is the exact reason why that we do that, right? Um, there's a terrific study, actually, that was done by SMUD, uh, again, Sacramento Municipal Utility District, um, that was done uh, on a, a population of autistic kids in, uh, I don't remember if it was Sacramento School District or others, but if you Google SMUD uh, and autistic study, it was also done in conjunction, I believe, with, with PNNL. Um, and what they were looking at was um, this whole notion of the photobiological history, right? So they were trying to see if uh, controlling that, that uh, photobiological range would actually result in uh, this, this population of autistic kids getting better sleep uh, and then coincidentally, um, then better, better behavior or more uh, traditional behavior, I guess is, is a better way to put it. So you might take a look at, at those studies as well. Um, there's also now, this, is out, this has been out for not quite a year, I believe at the moment. Um, as I mentioned that there are not a lot of consensus standards yet, but there are some standards that you can look at. Um, 
UL Underwriters Laboratory is an interesting this is an interesting thing for them because they're not really they're not a consensus standard group and they don't normally produce recommended practices like this. But uh, Mark Ray, uh, formerly from the Lighting Research Center, had had worked with uh, UL and put together uh, RP recommended practice two four four eight zero. Uh, recommended practice and guideline for promoting circadian entrainment of light for day active people. So this um, this gives it's a 77 page document or at least the the peer review one that I read was was 77 pages, um, and it, it does have a lot of interesting information in it. So I would encourage you to take a look at it. Um, but bear in mind it's not a consensus document like IES standards or ANSI standards hopefully those standards are coming. Um, a lot of the same people who have been working, for example, on this uh, UL recommendation are also the same people that we would expect to be working on an IES uh, consensus-based document. Uh, there is also a significant amount of information available at the Lighting Research Center on a variety of different topics for um, circadian entrainment and the ways that you can do that. Um, so again, this this kind of isn't a circadian entrainment class, but it is telling it is trying to tell you that that if we adopt the whole notion of these lighting controls, then we can manipulate these key variables. So whatever the recommendation becomes, this becomes a real opportunity for us to make the space better while at the same time saving enormous amounts of energy. I hope that all makes sense. Okay, so we are going to go to another pop quiz, and then we are going to look at some very specific uh, um, types of spaces that we might uh, that we might see. So, does timing of high light exposure seem to affect circadian entrainment? No. Maybe, yes. Or circadian is just a fad. What do you guys think? Mute myself and grab some more tea. All right, I am going to, most of you have voted. Thank you. Close and share. So as it turns out, um, the answer is yes. The timing really is important. And depending on whose research you're looking at, because there are, there are some outlier researches, um, it seems like from an alerting function as well as from a circadian entrainment, it seems like the, the, in, the um, higher incidence of light, the higher light levels are what really drives alerting functions and what really drives circadian entrainment. Um, color temperature, color spectral power distribution matters, but it seems like the key the key variable really is potentially uh, the, the, uh, the light level, which again really, really hammers home the notion that lighting controls are hugely beneficial in that kind of, of environment in what you're trying to do there. Right? So let me go ahead and hide this and look at questions. Okay. Um, question, could that high percentage be the amount of females in those industries? So the, the question here um, uh, relates back to the question with respect to the incidence of breast cancer in um, shift workers, right? Uh, and the high incidence, you know, with respect to um, shift care workers um, in the healthcare industry. So it was something like 43%. Um, sorry, I don't have the slide handy in front of me right now. But, um, and, and the incidence of shift where uh, shift workers had a breast cancer potential of two to one. And to be sure, I mean, there, there, there may be some issues there with respect to obviously um, the incidence of breast cancer in females is higher than in males, although it's, it's the breast cancer can happen to men as well. Now, um, and there are certainly other, um, 
other variables that may be at play there. Uh, but generically speaking, um, we see that there are a lot of physiological um, outcomes correlated with shift gear work. And again, things like poor sleep, things like um, potential obesity, things like um, uh, mood, uh, mood swings, mood issues, uh, cardiovascular uh, issues. So there are a lot of different potentials there. It's not just breast cancer, um, but yeah, to be sure. Uh, so again, um, I'm not a doctor. I'm not 100% um, up to speed on all of the research, um, but this has been an ongoing topic uh, of research and an ongoing topic of discussion, at least since um, uh, and the first time I encountered uh, that stuff it was probably around 2000, maybe even a little bit before that, uh, when I was working on a, a hospital in uh, Seoul, Korea, that, uh, that that was even then sort of being discussed. So, uh, although that would have been in the early days of, of kind of that discussion. Okay, so let's jump forward here. And let's talk a little bit about some very specific. How do we how do we take some of these ideas and turn them practical, right? What are some of the things that we might do in specific areas or specific kinds of spaces? Well, we can look at a few different areas, right, within some of the healthcare environment. Lobbies, right? Lobbies are patient waiting, patient intake, places like that. Um, someday we're all going to be able to go back into spaces like this, and we'll all go ahead and, and enjoy them and do all that kind of good stuff. But some of the things that you might find in here, you know, scheduled, right? Um, you're probably not going to use occupancy or vacancy sensors in places like this, but you are going to want to be able to either A, turn the lights off, or B, turn the lights down at specific times of the day. You're certainly going to want to use task tuning and high trim, right? So you're going to want to, again, modulate, since everything's dimmable, you want to modulate the amount of light so that you're getting the right light level that you want without wasting additional energy by over lighting the spaces. And again, task tuning high trim doesn't cost you anything more. It's simply a programming function in these kinds of systems, right? Um, now, you're likely to have zone controllers or um, rather than luminaire level lighting controllers in spaces like this, simply because you're likely to want to control things like down lights together in groups, right? You're also not likely to be able to associate the sensors with a down light or the sensors with a decorative light fixture. So you would use network lighting controls rather than luminaire level lighting controls in a space like this. By contrast, you jump into a typical exam room, right? Most exam rooms I've ever been in are over lighting, right? Uh, and I've had this conversation with a number of doctors. They, they agree, right, uh, that there's this idea of more, 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 more but that becomes kind of this glare bomb thing going on. So the ability to task tune those things to a proper light level, I think would be really, really useful. Um, perfect place for luminaire level lighting controls, right? You don't have to have, um, you don't have to have, have a, a network lighting control space a system in some place like this. Throw the, throw the LLC fixtures up in the ceiling, uh, program them to a wall switch and you're good, you're good to go. Uh, again, you want to do task tuning almost everywhere, right? Um, now, one of the things that you might find in here is tunable light. Do you want to change that, that um, um, the color temperature of the light? And it's, it's a hard question, right? Whether you want to be able to make things bluer, cooler, warmer, or whatever. One thing I would suggest to you is there's an idea called um, skin tone diagnostics, right? Where a doctor can glance at you and you might appear flushed, right? You might you might appear appear sort of reddish. Well, maybe that means you're you're having some issue with potentially with um, uh, going into shock, uh, or you're you're white for a very similar kind of thing. Uh, you might uh, appear yellow, in which case you're jaundiced, right? Where you might have issues with uh, bilirubin in your blood, and your, your your liver function might not be proper, or your gallbladder might have problems. A lot of different ways that you can you can engage with that. There's also something called capillary refill, right? You can you can squeeze the the um, um, your finger and how quickly it goes from white to normal color back. Now of course this is going to change change drastically in populations of I shouldn't say drastically. This is potentially going to have some some implications with respect to 
uh, communities of people of color as well, and how sort of the physiology appears with respect to light and what the doctor is expecting. So I'm going to suggest that in places like this, you probably want to select a color of the light and stick with it so that they are seeing people under the same light over and over again so that, that removes one of the variables with respect to skin tone diagnostics okay okay uh procedure rooms procedure rooms are very similar to exam rooms except that they tend to be places where you might have a little bit more exacting requirements you definitely are going to want dimming in these places manual dimming absolutely so this might be the same place that you go in for uh, maybe there's an outpatient, outpatient surgery, but very frequently there are also places where you're going to be doing diagnostics with a, uh, a a cart with a monitor on it. So, for example, if you're going in for a colonoscopy, you're going to be in a procedure room, right? And when the doctor is working or the technician is working with a monitor, they're probably going to want the light levels to dim way down. They might want to do from a lighting standpoint something like you've got here where you can see that there are lights here that are providing a little bit of light onto the wall here but not a lot of light uh, necessarily where a patient might be or a monitor might be uh, and of course you've got a, a specialty exam light and all those things uh, you're definitely going to want dimming you're definitely going to want um, um, high trim and all of that kind of good stuff. But you really, 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 the key thing here is you want manual dimming. You want whoever's operating this space to be able to manually select from a wide range of light levels. Operatories are very specialized places. You want to have the highest level of manual control you possibly can in an operatory. Some doctors like to have high light levels. Some doctors like to have very low light levels like we have here that are focused in on the patient with these specialty uh, operatory lights, right? Um, probably not gonna want color tuning, but I, I've actually heard from some people that, yeah, that, that some people really like to actually change things to uh, either blue or red light in operatories like this for their general lighting. Um, so that might be something that, that uh, you, you talk to your, your um, healthcare team with and, and see what they, what they actually prefer. Um, they are all, all, all different. You're absolutely going to want, however, manual dimming in these spaces. What about imaging, right? Imaging spaces. So uh, MRI or CT spaces more likely than we're, we're really talking about um, X-rays. X-rays are usually pretty quick. Uh, you walk in, you walk out, you're done. They're not terribly scary. Um, however, uh, when you go into one of these uh, imaging tubes, whether it's, again, computer tomography or MRI or similar, um, you're going to have a very different experience. And this is potentially really daunting and scaring, scary for some people. So from the perspective of the staff, you're absolutely going to want to be able to modulate the light up and down, raise lower, um, and be able to dim the light way down. You might also consider from the perspective of the patient doing something that's more interesting so that they actually have something to look at, right? Something more visually interesting so that it's not so scary. It's not such a daunting experience. Um, and you can control, you know, you've got a scene here where you've got something that is is sort of very entertaining for the patients to look at, but you're also going to want at various times to um, turn off this kind of stuff and much have a much higher light level so that the staff can go in and clean and and can you know do whatever antiseptic uh work that they have to do within that space also for when when techs have to come in and work on the machinery um, so this is again one of those places where um uh, advanced or network lighting controls can be hugely hugely beneficial now those are kind of specialty spaces what about less specialty spaces Everybody has corridors, right? Every place has spaces that look just like this. Now, in this particular case, this is either a transition corridor in which those doors might be offices or labs or conference rooms, or uh, it might be a clinic uh, corridor where those might be exam rooms, or potentially, but less likely, uh, something like, um, let's say, procedure rooms. So. In corridors like this, 
you might have scheduled times so that during the evening hours it either turns off or dims down or I might suggest this is an excellent opportunity to use LLLCs and schedule them in such a way that when nobody is in the corridor the lights are at say 20 percent light output and when people are in the corridor they dim up to full brightness. Right? This is an excellent excellent way to do high performance lighting saving energy while being really appropriate for the use of the space. Uh, you certainly want task tuning in there because you want to have again the light level uh, set to the target light level. You might do tunable white in some place like this. It'd be more likely to happen in here than it would in, in say for example an exam room. Now, patient corridors are very different, right? Patient corridors wind up being those places in hospitals where there are going to be patient inpatient rooms that are either double loaded, they're either going to be on both sides, or maybe they're on one side and there's staff stuff on the inside. You're really going to want to have opportunities here so that you probably can do tunable white, right, for circadian shifting. There may be areas that, depending on the what the consensus documents finally really tell us. There might be areas where, for example, we might have things called light showers, where we might have rooms where the staff can go in and for a certain period of time be exposed to much higher light levels coming from that, that uh, specific directionality to help them with their alerting functions, particularly for shift, for shift workers, right? We might wind up having things much lower light level, uh, much much dimmed or even warmer color temperature at night than we do during the daytime, right? We might have manual dimming for the nurses at their charting stations. There are a lot of different things that we might want to think about and put into these kinds of spaces. We might use occupancy sensors to dim levels. It's a it's a tough call. If you would want to discuss that with your clients, uh, it certainly is something that could could be done. Uh, I would want to I would want to really discuss that with the, the staff and figure out what uh, what they were comfortable with. Patient rooms, you're really probably not going to be doing much in the way of automated sensor systems here. Really, you want to have manual dimming control. You want to be able to make these folks as comfortable as you possibly can. You might start to do things like tunable white. Um, you definitely want to have dimmable lighting at, at any kind of charging station so that uh, during the daytime when the need for higher light levels is much greater, uh, the staff can see better there. At night when we make use of adaptive compensation and we can use lower light levels, you're really probably going to want to have that light level fairly low so it's not disturbing the patient. Uh, might also do color tuning in here like we did for uh, Children's Hospital there uh, with uh, CGF, right? Some of those things. Uh, you're also definitely going to want patient controllers, patient bed controllers, right? So, all right, we have come to our final pop quiz of the day. Is I oops, there's a typo. Is manual dimming potentially beneficial to staff and patients in most healthcare settings? Absolutely. Yes, no, maybe. Why would we add the complexity? What do you guys think? Bearing in mind again that manual dimming, when we're talking about modern lighting control systems, switching, dimming, and preset controls typically aren't an expense issue, they are typically a programming issue and a choice, right? They're about how we want to, to control them. And the good news about lighting controls, as with lighting, is that there's no right answer. There may be some wrong answers, but there's not really one right answer. All right, most of you have voted. I'm gonna close the thing and I'm gonna share. So most of us think that it is uh, potentially beneficial to, to staff and patients. And I'm going to agree with that, um, that absolutely. So any place that I can add manual dimming, whether it's in the healthcare environment or not, I'm absolutely going to do it. Why? Because everybody's eyes are different. 
everybody's perception is different. What you like may not be what I like, that's okay. But allowing people to select the ranges of light that most appropriately works for them in any given time period, particularly when it's not really an expense issue, do it whenever you possibly can. This is one of the most important benefits of LED lighting, and it's one of the most important benefits of network lighting controls in general, that it really, really, really does improve people's experience of the spaces. It really improves their um, happiness within those spaces. It potentially really improves their productivity in those spaces, and I would dare say it, it improves uh, patient outcomes as well, giving people the ability to be happier in their spaces. All right, so let's talk about a couple of um, other considerations that we might have in here. Whoops, I have got to, before I do that, hide. Okay, um, there are a number of considerations that you are gonna want to, to really pay attention to when you're, when you're applying these uh, lighting controls, right? We've just looked at um, some of the reasons that we might want to use lighting controls from a staff or a patient perspective. We've looked at some of the types of controls or some of the control strategies we might use. We've looked at some of the very specific types of spaces that you might find in the healthcare world. Now, some of the considerations that we really would want to think about here, um, to be sure, we're looking for simplicity, right? Um, particularly in the retrofit world, the easier we can go ahead and make things, the better. Uh, so ease of operations, ease of maintenance, ease of installation, all of these things. That really, to me, pushes people in a lot of ways towards the notion of luminaire level lighting controls. It doesn't have to be. You can do all the same things with network lighting controls that you can with LLC, because again, remember, LLC is just a subset of network lighting controls. But at the end of the day, the biggest issues that we need to be paying attention to with respect to both lighting and lighting controls, and, and in fact, the entire, the entire built environment for the healthcare world, uh, the most important thing is the patient outcome and preferences, right? What is it that is gonna make the patient most healthy? What is it that's gonna make the patient happiest? Um, we also need to pay strong attention to the staff well-being, right? It doesn't help anybody if the staff is not happy, healthy, and fully engaged in the healthcare environment. Um, we absolutely want to pay attention to energy savings. It's just that that can't be the only thing we pay attention to, right? Um, we can't simply develop projects where we're simply going to save X dollars without also paying attention to the patients and the staff. All of these things come together. The fantastic news is that if we put in a good network lighting control system, we have the ability to modulate everything that we've talked about. We have the ability to go ahead and have those energy savings while providing high-end patient outcomes, preferences, and providing for the staff well-being. Okay. Uh, one thing that we really need to pay attention to also is the notion of commissioning, right? So startup and programming, of lighting control systems matters, right? Going ahead and making sure that they are doing what we expect them to do. One of the most important parts is commissioning the occupants, letting the staff know how the system is supposed to work and how they're supposed to engage in it. Letting this person here know that they've got the ability to modulate their light with the device right here on the wall or however that comes in. So pay attention to those things. Now with respect to some of that stuff, we really need to pay attention to sequence of operation, right? So we've got the hardware, we've talked about all those things. We need to figure out exactly what that hardware is supposed to do. What wall stations are supposed to communicate with which uh, control zones? What's the timeout for the occupancy sensors? What are the schedules? What are the zones? Um, are there any particular details that we need to do? Somebody has to figure out all this stuff, right? And one of the things that's really interesting in the healthcare environment, there's a real kind of bounce back and forth about whether we want to use wired or wireless controls for these network lighting controls. From my perspective, I prefer wireless controls because they're easier, they're cheaper, they use less resources, 
um, and they're they're um, easier to re they're easier to to change over time, right? You can you can revise your your design more effectively. Now, from a cost standpoint, there's no there's no comparison. Um, wireless systems are tremendously less costly than wired systems, strictly from a labor standpoint, if, if nothing else, right? But it's important to understand that everything that we've talked about can be done. Almost everybody's systems are available with wired and wireless components to them. So you can still do wired systems if you want to, if your healthcare environment really, really, really wants wired systems, it's possible. It's just a little bit more costly. But there are some considerations you need to pay attention to with respect to wireless, right? One of the key ones is the same one that you would pay attention to with respect to, to laying out a Wi-Fi system. You need to make sure that you are going to have communications and robust communications from device to device based on the building and the distance. You have different distance between devices, is your building a one that has concrete walls with rebar, or is it one that has a more typical uh, gyp with um, metal studs between, right? That's going to have a real impact on the propagation of your wireless signal. Uh, do you have to pay attention to the uh, uh, cybersecurity? Of course you do. Um, wireless systems are subject to potential attack, just like wired systems are. So there's a lot of information kind of going back and forth with respect to this right now. Uh, in fact, uh, I think probably the DLC, I believe, has some really good information uh, or did online with respect to um, wireless uh, cybersecurity issues. In fact, if you go to the DLC, you can find their qualified products list, QPL, for uh, DLC Design Lights Consortium for um, um, systems like this. Uh, they have a, a qualified products list. One of the key categories has to do with cybersecurity. Uh, another thing to consider is flicker. All light sources flicker over time. It might be mildly irritating. It might be not an issue at all. It might be devastating. So, Pay attention to how things are flickering. Again, if you want really more information about Flickr, come to the, the conversation that Naomi Miller is going to be having with us next Thursday, again, IES Seattle. Or if you look at my network lighting controls class, you see a lot more information about Flickr there. Suffice to say, at the end of the day, what's really at issue here is that you're going to have potential for Flickr with lower range product, the higher range product tends to be less of an issue with respect to Flickr. Again, that's in the world of LED, that's very, very, very simplified. It depends on the type of driver you have. It depends on the type of dimming control you have, whether it's pulse width modulation or however you're, you're doing that. Again, the details are um, sort of in the, the deep dive class there. Now, um, I'm going to talk a little bit about the future of lighting, and then I'm going to come to one of the questions that just came here. So I'm just going to give you a quick little bit. We've, we've kind of gone through, this is in a two-hour class, it's really kind of a lot of information tossed at you at once. But, you know, we, we this is kind of where we've been. Where are we going, right? What is the future of lighting controls, particularly with respect to healthcare? One of the key things that we're all talking about with respect to healthcare, actually everything is the Internet of Things, right? IoT. So, you know, IoT is this idea that everything needs to talk to everything else. I was at a conference a while ago when somebody from AdNet was confidently talking about um, in the future, in the relatively near future, everybody's water bottle would have a sensor in it that would talk to their phone that would tell them, you know, how warm or how cool the water was. I thought that was really interesting. I'm not sure that I want that on my phone, and I've already got a sensor. It's lukewarm. It's not bad. So do I need an Internet of Things to, to tell me this stuff? Well, whether I do or not, it doesn't matter. It's coming, right? So one of the key things with respect to Internet of Things and healthcare has to do with asset tracking. So 
we have you know a network of lighting control devices and lights up in the ceiling that can potentially become a platform for other systems that will go ahead and track where things are. In the healthcare environment, what's an asset? Well, you're an asset, I'm an asset. The crash cart that might save your life in a, a cardiac event when you're in the emergency room is an asset. Being able to track where that crash cart happens to be, if it only saves a few seconds, those might be critical seconds. So while the whole notion of IoT gets a little scary for some people, it's not such a bad idea in this kind of healthcare environment. Also, if I'm a patient, I want to be tracked, right? I want them to know where I am. I want them to know what I want to have done. Another thing we might have here is Wi-Fi. Right? Wi-Fi is the notion that we use flashing light in order to be able to communicate. Now, this is something that is way far in the future, I think, here in the U.S., although it's be by way far in the future, I mean, I mean three to five years. Um, but it's something that's being implemented and experimented with extensively in Europe. Right? Okay. Um, now, implementation. Um, it's relatively easy to implement these things, right? We've talked about how you can go ahead and simply replace even one for one existing light fixtures. So I'm not gonna spend a lot of time with, with respect to that. Now, there is this notion that um, just from a, a um, costing standpoint, we really wanna pay attention, and I'm gonna, this, this is some stuff that, that Armando had put together. I'm gonna skip through this because uh, We've had some other some other uh, discussions going on here, but a key thing that I want to focus on here is that um, if you're doing a retrofit project, there's a real benefit to plugging into your utilities, right? Connect with your utilities, see what programs they might have, and go ahead, particularly with respect to networking and uh, um, luminaire level lighting controls. They probably have some level of specific support that is available uh, that you can connect into that can help make these projects uh, easier and cheaper to engage in. Right? Um, for example, uh, these are some of the savings that we might see assumed for controls from Seattle City Light. And you might find a, again, 50 to $75 bonus for using network lighting controls. Now, in addition to the handout information that I've, I've sort of pointed you to, if you go to the network, if you go to the Lighting Design Lab webpage, you'll find uh, that we have a variety of videos and other uh, papers, things that you can look at for best practices for LLC, including one on healthcare. Um, now, there has also been several reports commissioned by NIA, Northwest Energy Efficiency Alliance, that, uh, looking at things like one-for-one -one replacement of light fixtures with um, uh, LLC light fixtures, also incremental costing of LLC light fixtures. These are the additional resources that I've given you. And with that, I'm going to answer a question. If anybody has any more questions, please go ahead and, and ask them. Sophia has a question. Doesn't it make more sense to use wired controls in hospitals, especially near MRI CT scans? I thought the wireless systems can interfere with the machines. That's an excellent question, Sophia. Uh, so the good news is that um, these systems don't have to be one or the other. In most cases, most systems have the ability to use both. Right, so if I was going to be working in a space that had a high incidence of, let's say, uh, stray uh, electromagnetic spectrum or sensitivity to stray electromagnetic spectrum, like an MRI space, yeah, I'd probably use wired in there. Uh, however, if I am using, um, um, if I'm using, if I'm looking at the corridors or the exam rooms or places where it doesn't, I'm probably gonna use wireless. Now the backbone system is the same, the programming is the same. You're just using slightly different sensors. Now I would also say that if you're really concerned about wired versus wireless, uh, the actual sensors in an LLC are always wired, 
right? They're they're wired into the into the, the sensor. Um, you can also add wireless, for, wired versus wireless for a lot of different things. So, a uh, good example. Um, I just did a, a, one of the last big projects I designed before I came back to the lab was uh, a a software company down in uh, California where we did that same kind of hybrid approach. Some areas were wired, some areas are wireless. All right, any other questions? I am not seeing any, so I am going to just plow through for the last couple of slides here for us. Uh, thank you for coming. Thank you for being here. This is super fun for me to be able to do. Sorry, I've gone over by a minute or so. Um, Next week, Armando is going to be teaching, uh, giving a class, Lighting at Homes for Tomorrow 2020 Competition Winners. And uh, in a couple of weeks, uh, Armando actually will be doing Network Lighting Controls for Schools, which is a similar kind of talk, uh, talking about network lighting controls, very specific for uh, the educational environment. So please go ahead and come to that. Uh, again, you can contact me here. We are all part of Seattle City Light. We love Seattle City Light. Wonderful, wonderful place to be. And please take the survey um, before you exit. Uh, but I'll be glad to hang out here. If there are uh, any, any other questions, uh, please feel free to, to post them into the, uh, the chat and I can, I can hang out for a few. I hope this has been helpful for everybody and I hope that um, um, you've all that you'll learn something and I hope that you all have a fantastic and I do mean fantastic afternoon. Thank you for coming. Anybody? Anybody? All right. I am not seeing any other questions. So thank you all. And I will bid you all a good afternoon. Thank you. <laughs>